Welcome to Summit's Online Encounter. Our mission is to provide locations where people like you can have life-changing experiences with God. This is one of those locations. We also gather each week as a church in the heart of St. Paul. As disciples of Christ, we are doing our best to be on mission, deliver hope, and champion this city. At any point in your journey, if you want to take the next steps, or you just want to stay in the loop with everything going on at Summit, just grab your phone and simply text the phrase, Be Known, to 651-360-2908. We'll send you a short form. Please complete it so that you can be known in our Summit family. One of the ways to grow your faith is through worship. Worship with our lives in serving and worshiping Jesus with a song. We have pre-recorded some music in our sanctuary to create a place for you to worship with us virtually. So focus in, give way to the space needed, and invest some time in worshiping Jesus.
One of the rhythms that's important to following Jesus is studying scripture. As we study the Bible, we can have hope, find guidance, be corrected, and receive truth into our lives. Let's open God's word and hear this week's message. We've been in Matthew 13. Many of you know this parable, and a couple weeks ago I talked a little bit about broken masterpieces. What does it mean to be broken? What does it take to make a masterpiece, but do masterpieces really stay or do they become something in pieces? Like, are they fractured? Is there an element where God made us and then we have a great time through the course of time undoing what he made? And so there's levels to this, and there's an idea of how are we broken. And so we've been asking the text that question, and Jesus' teachings in Matthew 13 really help us focus on the different areas that we are broken, and that we need to be broken, and that we are journeying in. So there's four soils in Matthew 13. There's four different soils. There's a rocky soil, there's a shallow soil. We talked about that Last week, there's a crowded soil, and then there's the good soil. And what you need to know about Ancient Farming Methods 101 is we look at those soils as four different fields, just like there's four different sections of seating in our sanctuary. The rocky soils here. The shallow soils right here. Bill wanted this sermon to end early last week. That's why this is shallow soil. The good, shallow, the good soil's over here, and this is the crowded soil because there's a whole bunch of guests from other churches here in this section. I'm talking to Betty's son. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but the truth is, is we think of those soils in four different fields. What you need to know is those four different soils existed in one field. And so in the human heart, which is a garden that you till and that the Holy Spirit works in, you have these four soils in your life in different places in your life. I think sometimes it's like it's a lot of pressure just to be the good soil when areas of our life are just simply rocky. Some of those areas in our life, it is good soil, but we have a crowded heart with our kids and their sports schedules. We could go through the list, but what you need to know is those four soils exist in every single one of us. Open your Bibles to Matthew 13. Matthew 13. The same day Jesus went out to the house and sat by the lake, and such a large crowd gathered around him that we got in a boat and sat in it. The parable of the sower, uh, the sower, the the cove of the sower, the acoustics there, there. We talked about that. You can hear more about that at our podcast if you want to dive deep just in this first section. And Jesus says, a farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds would would eat it up. And the harvest, uh, the the corn, the, the harvest, excuse me, and the birds would come and eat that seed up as it's it's spread on that rocky soil. And Jesus interprets the parable in verse 19. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, The evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. So this is the hard soil. And just by way of review, how do we, well, till that soil in our life, and how do we till that soil in other people's lives? Well, Jesus gives us the key. You need, they need, understanding. If you don't understand it, that's when the rocks show up. Peter asked all kinds of questions to Jesus, especially in Matthew 19. And Jesus let him ask a lot of different questions. I love the one in Matthew 19, 27, where Peter stands up and he goes, Hey, listen, Jesus, I sold everything to follow you. We all did. We left our homes. What, is, what, what am I going to get out of this? He asked a question that no one else would ask, and he needed understanding. And in that moment, as Jesus answers that question, in areas of your life that you need understanding, those rocks disintegrate, and they become in a process called weathering, and it's a beautiful display of how those things can shift. What do you need to know? What do they need to know? I had a friend that... uh, is an amazing filmmaker. He just got engaged. He's got a call of God on his life. 
He's uh, hopefully going to be an intern here. He's done amazing uh, work all, so far. He's working on his commitments and his punctuality. And his life has got a lot of amazing potential. I'm talking about Nehemiah. He's sitting right over here. He asked me a, one question. He, he, sent me a, he sent me a text. He said, hey, Pastor Eric, I got a question. And it was about a different worldview. And he asked me these questions about people that were in his life about someone who has an underpinning of faith that doesn't base it on the Bible, but a different book altogether. And you know what he was really asking me? Pastor Eric, in my friend who I love, how do I till the rocky soil? Because they don't understand. And in that same breath, the evangelistic, the burden for, for that surfaced in my heart as I saw that on display in his. So who is in your life that needs understanding about God, about the things that we all encounter? Why do bad things happen to good people? If God's all-powerful, then why does he allow these things to exist? Either he's all-powerful or he's not benevolent, but either way, these are questions that we've asked for a millennia, and the word gives us an answer. But in that same way, uh, I, I made a question box last week with a magic marker. It might be probably one of my best pieces of art I've ever created. It's an Amazon box that had vitamins in it. And it's got a big purple question mark. And it's at the Welcome Center. And if you have a question about faith, or if you have someone in your life that has a question or needs understanding, write it in there. And if you're bold enough, actually put your name on it. If you don't want to put your name on it, you will, might just ask the question you actually have. Because if you put your name on it, then all of a sudden there's a risk of somebody actually knowing that you don't know. We like to preserve ourself and especially the appearance of it. Ask the question you actually have. I got a couple questions that were in the box. I'm going to read them. Why am I stuck where I'm at right now? No name, just why am I stuck where I'm at right now? Didn't even put a question mark on it. That's lazy punctuation right there. But let me just tell you something. If you feel like you're stuck where you're at right now, it's because you're impatient. And you're in process. And the creator of the universe is more interested in your stillness than your stuckness. And you need to slow down and stop looking at what you're stuck in and start looking at what he's preparing you for. Because a lot of times when we get in these situations, we go, oh, I'm stuck. I, my life, we want our life to be like a stock chart and we want it to grow fast and rapid. You know what grows fast? Cancer. So slow down and be stuck. Hide in the cleft of the rock like the prophets did and allow God to work in the process. And don't rush it because when you start kicking doors open, you go through doors that you never were supposed to go through. You're not stuck. In fact, when you put on the whole armor of God, in fact, that's another question, and she wasn't afraid to put it. She says, I ain't scared to leave my name. <laughs> it's like, you want to fight? It's like, let's go, Rochelle. Come on, bring it up here right now. You want to step to this? I'll take these off. These are my good boots. Like, you knew it was Rochelle? Oh, that's funny. Just by the question. Um, I just wish you would have said, I ain't scared. <laughs> that would have been more on point for you. But she asked a question about the, the, the armor of God. And, and she's got a great like, seed in my heart about a base camp about the armor of God that I would love to lead you through. But one of the things that after we put on the armor of God, we don't stay stuck. We actually stand firm. And so part of the reason why you're stuck is because you're so focused on the present stuckness that you forgot to put on the armor. And after that, stand. And that's an active position, standing. That's a sermon in and of itself. But that's a question that you had. Here's the other one. How do I accept the better thing? Well, let me just read it verbatim. And some of you need to slow down when you're writing these. 
how do I accept things better that are not what I want? Parenthesis, selfish. So how do I accept the things better that are not what I want? Am I selfish? Maybe? How do I gain patience with these things? So in the first part of this question, this question is singular. How do I accept the thing better that I want? And then how do I gain patience with these things? Now it's plural. Which is it? Well, see, how do you accept a thing that is better than what you want? You need to know that what is in the word is better. And when the Holy Spirit speaks to you through his word, that is the measure of what is better. And sometimes we have to accept that over not just a period of time, but a moment in time. And we draw a line in the sand and we say, this is repentance for me and my house. I'm going to serve the Lord. I am choosing to come underneath spiritual authority that the word is asking me to live and adjust my life in. And maybe that's you. Maybe you need to do that. Maybe you've never decided to actually make that demarcation line in the timeline of your life. And you said, I was this, but now I'm this. And the other thing that I would say is, yeah, you probably are selfish. We all are. Every single one of us want what we want. My kids would eat Skittles and donuts every day if I let them. But I'm their father. I know what's best in that area. And they'll have to be in that space. The other thing I'll say is, how do we gain patience? Well, patience is a fruit of the Spirit, and fruit is cultivated. It's a gift of the Spirit that God gives us to have the ability to cultivate that fruit of the Spirit within us. We're going to talk about patience. In fact, next week, Pastor Chad is going to preach as your pastor here on staff with us, other pastors, for the first time as one of the pastors, not a guest speaker, but he's going to release a word about cultivate. No, you can clap for that. And don't you dare make plans to skip because we're going to go through a journey about the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience. One of those is going to be patience. And we want to help you equip, be equipped to gain, but cultivate patience in your life. And so we're going to talk about the last part of that question because it sounds like there's things, plural, that you just need to rest in. If you have a question, put it in the box. I guarantee you one thing, I will read it. Jesus allowed him to ask questions, and he always responds in grace. How do we cultivate the hard soil in our life? How do we cultivate the hard soil in your life and others' life? you got to ask the question you actually have. That's so important. There's no such thing as a dumb question unless it's not asked. You have to ask the question you have. Be bold enough because some of you need to be safe in that place to ask that real question. And I will do my best as your pastor, as the lead shepherd here, to create a place where it is safe for you to ask the real question. Because I have them too. Second thing we talked about was the shallow soil. Jesus in Matthew 13, 5, pick up with me. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow and the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Jesus says in verse 20, the seed falling on the rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word, and once they receive it with joy, verse 21, but since they have no root, they only last a short time. When trouble or persecution, the heat in the kitchen is turned up, because of the word, they fall away quickly. That's the shallow soil. So how do we till and deepen the soil in our lives or our root structure, specifically that Jesus says, you have no root? How do you grow deeper roots? How do the people around you have that moment where they hear the word and the roots are allowed to grow? Two things, we talked about it, time and forgiveness. Roots need water, sun, dirt. They need to stay still. Can I just pause for just a second? Because this church is growing. Summit Church is growing. We're going to continue to grow. This church will probably be a church of 500 within a year or two. I don't think it's going to slow down. Because there's something different here. And it's the Spirit of God working through you who are different. 
We're just a bunch of ragtag group of like misfits getting together going, let's just do this thing. There's something about the underdog. Even if you're a Minnesota Viking fan, last night you were cheering for the Packers. Yeah, you were. Get out of here, Nehemiah. My point is, is in this place, I'll just say this. Roots not only need sun and water, but they need to stay still. And you are going to have a choice at some point in your journey here at Summit to decide I'm done with this place, I'm going to a different church. You're going to decide, I'm, I'm taking my roots and I'm going somewhere else. Number, number one, don't ever leave hurt. Because that pain will travel well. And number two, don't ever think that I notice or don't notice when you don't show up or you're not here, or you don't return any form of communication. And don't think, number three, that I don't take that personal and serious. But roots need to be stable in one part of the soil for them to grow. You keep transplanting a tree, the tree will never turn into an oak. And church, especially church in the West, it will suck the idolatry out of you faster than anything else. Church hurt is the worst hurt and we got to continue to wade through that. But I will tell you right now, you are going to have to make a decision. Do you attend here or did God call you here? Because when you attend here, and this is just a thing that you do on Sunday for an hour and whatever, and it's just that, and Monday through Saturday doesn't matter, and we're not growing and actually in community with one another, then you will attend a place that will have better programs and better resources and more money and a pastor that doesn't look like he just walked out of Arizona. The reality is you will attend somewhere else. But if the sovereign God of the universe has called you here and has asked you to root in here, which I believe he has, because it's wide open. It's wide open. There's a beautiful thing that we are in. And it's called the kingdom of God. And he's doing something again here at Summit. And you're a part of it. So stay rooted. Decide. Put a line in the sand. You know what? Pastor Eric ticks me off. Somebody at Summit Sisters ticks me off. Somebody at some base camp says something I don't like. I was in the basement and I felt like I wasn't, I came to the welcome desk. And you know what? There are going to be problems, but there also are going to be people that are bold enough and meek enough and humble enough to not let the measure of how things begin choose to determine how things end. Be glue in this place. But you will grow in the house that you are planted. That isn't an ask for you to stay put. That is simply a reality of spiritual authority and your roots need to grow. There is so much that God has for you. And if you keep moving around, and you keep pulling yourself up from the soil, you'll never see all of those things that he has for you. And that's not just opposing some of you that have come from other churches and other fellowships over a course of time because I honestly believe that God is calling you inside your spirit. The other thing that it needs, not only does it need time, but it needs forgiveness. Jesus always instructs, always disciplines, but he never rejects Peter. Never rejects him. When we wither because our roots are shallow. When someone makes a mistake at this church and they drop the ball, give them time and give them forgiveness. How much? Till the time that Jesus comes back or 70 times seven, Jesus says. People need time and forgiveness. That's what Peter needed to allow his roots to grow. Why do you think we would be any different? So let's be like Jesus. Let's be a church where people can wither and they're not disposed. Christians love to eat their wounded. Let's heal ours. Let's protect ours. Let's give them time. Let's extend forgiveness and let's see what this failure unlocks for their future. People aren't disposable. You know this. Act like it. Because that's how roots grow deep. Matthew 13, let's get to our next soil. 
Other seed fell among thorns, Jesus says in Matthew 13, 7, which grew up and choked the plants. Matthew 13, 7. Other seeds fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Okay, so just shut your eyes for a second. You've got this beautiful patch of garden. You plant in some tomato seeds, and then you come back a week later. It's all thistles and a few tomatoes. Open your eyes. My wife and I have got a little bit of a place where we had a garden. And uh, the garden is big. And I got tired of tilling. And I got tired of her tilling. Because she'd be gone for like four days and she'd sleep in a little shed. (laughs) So I built these garden boxes. There's a bunch of them. And they're made out of cedar and they got this kind of like rough steel on the sides and we fill them with dirt and now we only have to till that area rather than the whole area we just got to do that raised garden bed and so there's something beautiful about the weeds being mitigated because we're concentrating on just a smaller space I thought that was going to solve our problem but guess what the weeds can scale walls I don't know if you know this or not, but they're really good climbers. I saw a thistle plant, like on belay, coming up into the... And the reality is the weeds and the wheat are going to grow together. Jesus even talks about this. But specifically in this parable, what does this crowded soil, as I call it, mean? Jesus answers the question in verse 22. The seed among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, choke the word, making it unfruitful. Underline this. The worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth. A lot of times we just focus in on the deceitfulness of wealth, but I'm talking about the worries of this world. So what are you worried about? I mean, you might not be worried about it right this second, but I guarantee you think about it. We've got a list. I love that Jesus calls deceitfulness of wealth. Do you know the difference between someone who's got nothing? Like they're poor as the day is long as far as finances are concerned. And the, the difference, if you're not careful, to someone who has everything and they're rich as the day is long and they've got more money to burn. They're both in a ghetto of financial poverty if they're not careful. One needs to be rescued from the ghetto of their wealth and one needs to be rescued from the ghetto of their poverty financially. You see, sometimes I think we we look at the way that we operate in the world, specifically with the word wealth, and we think, if I only made this much, I'd be able to do it. The reality is the deceitfulness, the trick of this is, there is lack in both. But I'll just say that this soil, for me, is the crowded soil. You've got plants and you've got everything else that's growing up around it. The deceitfulness of wealth is one thing. The busyness of other things is another. You are busy. What are you busy with? You are too busy with blank. Put it in your mind. You just feel like it just, it's constant. I'm going to say the word laundry. Locking it in. Final answer. I'm going to phone a friend. Danielle, laundry? I feel like, I feel like it's never ending. Pastor Appreciation Sunday, guess what? You guys are all coming over and we're doing my laundry. <laughs> I'm kidding. Bobby, knock it off. You're, you're already like, okay. I'm gonna. <laughs> you were too busy with blank to be about the Father's business. We talked about this before. The Father's business is going to require time and margin. And sometimes we're too busy that we have no time and margin. And so we become crowded soil, the worries of this life. You need perspective. So what's the worry in your life? What's the worry in other people's lives? 
A lot of times, that's why I think Jesus went right to money right after the example of the worries of this life. He could have listed a whole bunch, but he just said one. Because often, when we think about our life and our jobs and our career and mammon and the future and all the crap we want to buy and the things we want to experience, often it falls in the category of needing resource, cash, money, Bitcoin, crypto, gold, silver, frankincense, and myrrh. It requires some sort of asset to get to that space. And so we worry about that. We worry about if we're going to run out of money. Should we sell our car? Should we give our car? Should we, like, have a house? Have another house? Should we sell this house? Should we downsize? Should we upscale? Should I start getting on a, a place where I send out my resume so I can make more money? See, the, the, the worries of this world, Jesus gives one example, and that's the deceitfulness of wealth. And I just want to just say, that is easy for us to fall into. Having money be our God and crowding our heart and do you know why a lot of times people pick up side hustle or have extra jobs? Let's be honest. You don't need the money. You want the money. And that comes at a cost. And Jesus says the deceitfulness of this world, the fact that your heart is going to be crowded, one of those things, it might just be the fact that you're pursuing money in the kingdom versus me in the kingdom. And that's not to say that if you are a person of wealth, that you're in sin. That's not to say that people that make billions of dollars can't handle this, because the word speaks to that too. I will say this to you. Number one, some of you have a poverty mindset. In the deceitfulness of the world, you're stuck in a poverty mindset. You think that's the last you're ever going to have. You're stuck in that space, and so you hoard. It's because you grew up poor. You had nothing. You, you literally went through rehab and lost it all. I don't know what it is, but some of you are a crowded heart because of a poverty mindset that's in your heart, and you think this is the last thing that you're ever going to have, and you eat like it too. Especially when you do like a church meal. Some of you like boxing it up for later. It's a poverty mindset that helps us really look at the idea that we are, have a crowded heart because we're, we're, we're worried, we have a deceitful part of the world that this is the source. And can I remind you all this real truth? Your job ain't the source. Your paycheck ain't the source. Your 401k, your retirements, all that crap, it ain't the source. God is the source. He is the source of all those things that he gives to you. Quit worrying that it's the last paycheck you're going to have and do what God has you to do, live as he has you to live, and you will be blessed. And I'm not talking about a Rolls Royce and a bunch of Gucci. I'm talking about what you need versus what you want. And you'll be blessed in intangibles. You'll have provision in ways that you can't buy or you can't get at a bank. But some of you got to quit living like it's the last thing that you're living for. It's not the end. Some of you have a provision mindset where you're sitting in this church and you've got more money than you know what to do with. You're like picking out where you're going to go on vacation and the world is your choice. Like, I'm going to go on a family trip. Where do you want to go? I don't know. Pick a city. How about Prague? We've never been there. That's amazing that God has allowed you to do that. But remember, that provision mindset is equally dangerous. It can crowd your heart that that's what we're pursuing, the pleasures of this world. Jim Carrey said an amazing quote, and it basically goes like this. He's been on quite a faith journey, by the way. He said, I wish everyone could get rich and famous so they would realize that you shouldn't be rich and famous. More or less. The reality is the poverty mindset, the provision mindset, is that all money buys. Is this it? This is one area where I believe Jesus focuses us on the crowded heart. What we do with our time 
that is our life currency. And you will invest in the kingdom of God and you'll invest in your other kingdoms and those things both have value, but one has eternal value. I'll give one example about a crowded heart, and that's just simply a container. This is our welcome bag. And for those of you that keep filling out Connect cards, and you've got 40 mugs, and, and you just get, like, bring me copies of my book back, and, and I know there's coffee in here, but... You can get this at a store or here as well. Stop filling out Connect cards for free stuff. I'm talking to you. But the reality is, is life is like this bag. And we've got all kinds of stuff that's got to go in here. Okay? I want you to think about what you put in the container that's your life. So if we just started throwing things in here, work, rest, kids, taxes. Because you start throwing all your things that you got to do in your life in here. And we just start like putting all the big blocks. Well, we, we try to maybe put the big ones in first and then we just keep going and we keep going and the container of life eventually just gets so full that when it comes to church or journeying as a church, as the people of God, we've got no room in there anymore. And you know what happens? Why people just decide that church is not a part of their journey like this? It's because their heart is crowded. Church becomes something that it never was intended to be. Church is not a building. It's not a brand. It's not a budget. It's not some sort of social club. Church, the word church in the word is a gathering of people pursuing Jesus together. That the gates of hell will never fail or never uh, uh, prevail against it. That's what church is. We bankrupt the word church when we try and fit in church with our kids' sports schedules and our work schedules, and we just like, I'll get there when I get there. And it's not about Sunday morning, because what's more important that we do as a church in this year is what we do Monday through Saturday. But the trick is we got to stop fitting in the kingdom of God among everything else. Now, I'm going to be careful or cautious with this example because this, this has got a Summit logo that's been stamped on it, so I don't want you to read into this as like a ploy for being over-marketed. But what if church, what if the experience of life, the community that we're walking with together... What if that's actually the container that everything else fits in? What if your journey with one another in this place, as us, the people of God, at Summit, through this local church, what, what if that's the container that everything fits in? There's a big difference between trying to fit in church as a puzzle piece and let church be the puzzle that everything fits in. You see, when you make that shift, when you do that, and you see this for what it really is and how we've bankrupt this word, church, all of a sudden, it's different. Your heart is less crowded because the worries of this world are contained within a people in a garden where you bear one another's burdens. There's all kinds of examples I could give about this, about our crowded hearts. Jesus talks about money, and I just is going to simply say, we got to reclaim the word church. Post-COVID, during COVID, church was what? You could go to church by just streaming it online. That's not church. I'm not interested in passing the internet. I don't want to pastor the internet. Does that make sense? It doesn't mean that God can't use those spaces, but that is not church. Online church is not church. Get it in your brain. That is so short of what church really is. When you're sick and you're in the hospital and someone shows up in this room at that bedside that isn't me or isn't the staff, we become the church. We finally figure it out. It's not, your ministry is not like to watch me do the ministry. 
And that is a place where we need to till the soil to understand that the busyness of life needs rest, that the crowded heart Jesus talks about is the pursuit or the deceitfulness of wealth, both in lack and in plenty. And the example I would make is the body of Christ being something that everything fits into, not something we just try to fit into something else. Jesus says in Matthew 8, still the other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop 160 or 30 times which it was sown. Jesus says the good soil was a crazy amount of harvest. I'm not going to go into the side notes here of what I put in my notes just for the sake of time, but if you'd like, uh, you can just write down Genesis 26, 12, and I'd be happy to have a discussion about that at a later time. Christy, as you come to the piano, I just want to ask you the question, church. If the seed fell on good soil, the question I have for today is, how does soil become soil? Have you ever thought about that? How does dirt become dirt? Well, I'm going to read it to you. You ready? Rock that gets exposed first. You have to have rocks that are exposed to the elements. So you've got to have some hard soil to begin with. And over the process of what is called weathering, those rocks actually start to break down into smaller particles. Now, not only do you need the weathering process on the hard soil, but you need all of the life that has been growing and springing up and then withering away because it didn't have roots to die and decay on the surface of these rocks. So you need a lot of death involved to make one part of soil. Then you need a whole bunch of crap. You need manure. You need nitrogen. You need fertile, rich waste that goes through a process. And you walk through it and you're in it. Soil becomes soil by rocks that are truly weathered into particles after plants and animals die and decay and decompose and you add at air, atmosphere, and you add the refreshing uh, flow of water and you finally get good soil. I'll just say this as clearly as I can say. Good soil comes from hard soil through weathering via storms, decomposing from death, with the atmosphere and the refreshing, good soil comes from breaking. It comes from a process of death and all kinds of crap. And the reality is, is if you want to be good soil, in Exodus 30, I won't read it to you, but there's this concept about good oil. There's an apothecary that made oil. God gives us a recipe in, Gen in Exodus 30, and he says, take these spices and this and that and, and cumin and all of the different lavenders, and you break them down and you make it into what is known as anointing oil. The anointing oil that went into the vessel, that, that in the New Testament, we only lay oil on people who are sick and we pray for them. That's how it's used now. How it's used then is they used it to consecrate things. But this oil had a recipe. But to make this oil, it had to be broken. It had to be stomped on a threshing floor. And it had to go through a process to release the anointing through the breaking. So I have a question for you. Do you really want to be good soil? Because if you don't want to be good soil, then don't ask to become good soil. Because good soil is made through weathering, through all kinds of crap, all kinds of storms, all kinds of death, all kinds of circumstance, all kinds of really hard stuff. And then, and only then, when the word is planted in that kind of person, it springs up such a harvest that's so foreign to even farming methods that it would far exceed anything you could ever do. That's a very dangerous prayer. 
on the other side of this, do you know why you're good soil? Do you know why some of you are amazing soil? It's because you've gone through some really hard things. And you're teachable, and you're humble, and you're reliant, and you're resilient, but you've been broken. See, everybody wants fruit. Everybody wants what somebody has. But nobody wants the process to get there. I could tell you stories about how I became the pastor here at Summit. I've only been here for two years with my wife, but as we started our ministry, I will say this, it started with breaking. I'm not going to display the trophy case today in this short amount of time, but we have been broken at different places in our life, in our marriage, in our circumstances where we faced insurmountable odds. And the only thing that I've ever realized is that is the process to become good soil. So if you want to be good soil or better soil or you want to till that soil, pray this bold prayer before you go home. Holy Spirit, do whatever it takes. Bring the weather, bring the decay, bring the death. I'm choosing you. It's a dangerous prayer because I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you pray that prayer, your heart's going to get tilled by all means necessary. And he's interested in your completion, not your comfort. And the good soil refers to someone, Jesus says in verse 23, He hears, she hears the word. And you do your own devotionals and you hear it here at our church gatherings and you hear the word and you understanding it. Understand it. Hearing and understanding are two different realities and Jesus brings us full circle to back to the hard rocks. Because if you don't understand in your good soil, you risk being hard soil again. He brings us full circle. So keep hearing and keep understanding. Jesus says in Mark 7, 14, hear me, all of you, and understand. The word for understand in the Greek to set or bring together in a hostile sense of combatants, there's going to be a way that you think and a way that the word says, and it's going to butt up with one another at times. The cinnamon, uh, the cinnamons, the cinnamons, Synonyms. I I like cinnamon, though. (laughs) A knowledge grounded on personal experience to see with the mind's eye. A knowledge attained by proximity because of experience. Insight gained through the five senses. See, this good soil is someone who's been broken, someone who asked to be broken, someone who was in process with that weathering, and they hear and they understand. Good soil is someone who hears and sets or brings together in the soul the seat of the mind, will, and emotions, the truth of Christ displacing the truth in you. I'm going to say that one more time real slow for the podcast and for you. Good soil is someone who hears and sets or brings together in the soul the truth of Christ displacing the truth in you. That is when good soil starts to grow. So I'm asking you today before you go, we're going to meet in the basement. Those of you that have that invite, you know because you're on a serve team and uh, your team lead has talked to you about this. You've got an email, you registered. I'll see you in the basement in just 15, 20 minutes. But before you go, if you want to be good soil, invite the process. All I can say is the harvest you'll see will be amazing. He will do things with you and through you that you could never ask, seek, or imagine. And it will bear fruit in your life and in this city as we build the kingdom of God together. God, I just pray that we would Look at these soils not only in us, but in the hearts of others. And when we see what soils we are or they are, I pray, Lord, that we have ears to hear. That we would rest. And we would work. in tilling those areas of our heart that you are working in. God, for those of us that pray this 
bold prayer about wanting to be good soil. God, make it a process that they can continue to walk in, not be defeated in. Minister to them along the way as they're weathered, as they deal with the death that's around them and the hard things. Help them to continue to walk in those seasons where, where those sections of track, really, Lord, where they're, where they're basing what they know, not what they feel when it comes to their faith. Make this church good soil and let the harvest outpour into this city and use us as these broken masterpieces to be put together to make something far more valuable than we could ever be in the first place. In Jesus' name. Before you go, just leave reverently if you do. You can take just a minute or two or just a sentence. If you want to become that good soil, ask, seek, knock. You who have ears, let you hear. To help you apply the truth found in Scripture, we always like to ask three questions. What did you learn about God? What did you learn about yourself? And how are you going to apply what the Holy Spirit is speaking through Scripture to your life? We hope that these questions help bring clarity for you. Thank you for being a part of our online encounter. Join us in person sometime as we gather as a church on Summit Avenue. Or join us here virtually again next week. Let me just say, our city of St. Paul is absolutely amazing. I encourage you to check out all the history it has to offer. And you need to know Summit Church, this church has been a part of that history with so many amazing churches in our city. But speaking specifically about the people of Summit, well, we've been gathering here since 1932. And my hope is that this would be a rich history. It would be our forward legacy. History is a thing of the past, but legacy, it makes way, you know, for the future. So the question I have for us is, where are we going? Uh, that is a good question. Our vision is simple. It's really to see all of people and beyond living as disciples of Christ, people full of hope, uh, fully known, actively loving one another, living a spirit-led life. Our mission, it's also simple as well, to provide rhythm, location, opportunity for you to have a life-changing experience with God. Uh, you know, we all journey in our diversity to do these three things. Become disciples of Jesus, deliver hope, and to champion our city. That's where we're going, and that's what we're doing. So maybe a question for you is, where are you going? You know, what are your next steps? I would encourage you to do this. Join one of our monthly expeditions. The expedition is a simple experience where you can find out more about who you are in Christ, who Summit Church is, what we do around here, and how you can maybe even you know, play a part. It's less than two hours of your time uh, for the whole month. We also feed you amazing food and even provide childcare. So the question is, where are you going? Hopefully to the expedition is my thought. We're all on a journey following Jesus, maybe together. We just might not be us without you. We'll see you at the summit.